Never let your daughter marry a peasant whose head is full of dirt and feet with cow patties. Quick, marry her to the gold mountain man who will return with tons of money. Hi, my name is Mark Forsythe from the BC Historical Federation, and it is my pleasure to be in Vancouver's Chinatown right now with Carol Lee, who is one of the uh, brains behind this new uh, Vancouver Chinatown Storytelling Center. It's, it's a remarkable place, and I'm going to ask Carol, first of all, to tell us uh, your connection to this and uh, where, where we are right now. So we're in the heart of uh, Vancouver Chinatown in the Vancouver in the Chinatown Storytelling Center and I'm the chair of the Vancouver Chinatown Foundation and our mission is to try and revitalize the neighborhood while retaining its irreplaceable cultural heritage and this storytelling center is the, our most important piece of the cultural revitalization pillar. The foundation acquired this building uh, from Bank of Montreal in 2016. We felt that it was because of its location, it's in the heart of Chinatown, that it would be a good place to have a storytelling center. It was really, I, I, I want to say, the brainchild of my business partner, um, Dr. Henry Fong. He felt that it was, uh, you know, could be the right size for something that kind of told the story of the Chinese Canadian experience. And uh, it's not a huge footprint. There's about 4,000 square feet on the main floor, but probably in about 30 minutes or 40 minutes, you can go through and have a better idea of what that, that journey for those early Chinese pioneers looked like. Including Thomas Ma, yes. who worked here, didn't he? Who worked here. It was actually the building a couple of doors down, but he was the first Chinese Canadian bank manager of any bank in Canada. And he was a pillar of this community as well. So I, I'd heard a lot about Tommy Ma. He was trying to you know, build community, but also really trying to support the local businesses. We're not really a, a collecting museum, but I think that you know, it's wonderful if you can have some objects that help highlight the story. So Wally Chung is one of our founding trustees, and uh, he had donated 25,000 objects to uh, UBC. It's known as the Chung Collection. So it was a, a, a tremendous collection that related to Chinese immigration and also to the CPR. So when we were you know, discussing opening up this uh, storytelling center, I went to him and I said, well, you know, maybe we can borrow a few things from uh, UBC, your collection there, to try and highlight our story um, of the gold rush. And he said, well, I have a few things left in my personal collection. And so that's what we see here at the Chinatown Storytelling Center. And the, the leather bag on, on the left-hand side, that's a fire bucket it, from Parkerville. Yes, I think it's an early form of a fire extinguisher, actually. So I think after the fire in Barkerville, they probably equipped everybody that lived there with one of these leather bags. Um, they were probably filled with water next to their beds. But uh, I think it gives you some idea of what the life was like back then. And, and that's, you know, what I think is kind of the storytelling center is, is, you know, for, um, you know, new generations um, to really kind of appreciate what life was like how hard life was for the people that came in those very early days. So it's, an, it's a, a phrase book, but the top, there's two rows of Chinese. So above the f English phrase, there's the actual translation in um, Toi San Wa. But underneath, it is the phonetic sort of way how, of how you would actually say it in English. And I think that the pronunciation guide. Exactly, a pronunciation What's guide. What, what is in this? Manual? Well, you have things like... You know, is there any insurance or the policy ran out last week? You know, a gang of men are wanted for grading. So you can imagine how, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of phrases you would probably need to get through everyday life. The, the other objects that you have from, from the railway history, where, where did well, you find those? Well, the, these are, the, the rest of these are from, uh, from Wally Chung. But I was lifting this, so this pick, and, you know, is remarkably heavy. And so it made me think about how hard it was for these people, these men, to work, you know, lifting this, you know, multiple hundreds and hundreds of times a day, every day, probably seven days a week. So it was arduous work, for sure. At half yeah. the wage. Of At half what the wage. The, the yeah. white workers yeah. were making. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the, so the completion of the railroad happened in around 1885. And it's interesting because that is, basically coincides with the, the beginning of Chinatown. They had nowhere to go, and so they ended up sort of the edge of, of Vancouver. It was, I think the translation is Saltwater City. We are on the edge of a, of a swamp. So this is in, in 1885. Um, they instituted the head tax, so as a way of, of trying to restrict the number of immigrants coming from China. But they still wanted to come because, as I said, things were still bad in China, so it was still w worthwhile to come to Canada and try and have a new future in this country. Finally, in 1923, um, they instituted the, the Exclusion Act, which basically barred people from coming in from China. Well, you know, they were called, I think, the, the Bachelor Society. And, and if you think about, you know, the earlier chapter when you had the, um, the head tax and the Exclusion Act. So these men um, often, you know, were, they, they, they died alone. And it was sad. I've, I've been talking to friends about how they remember these men and they would see, you know, especially young boys. They would look longingly because they, 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 everybody would want to have a son. But it was not possible for them. There just wasn't any women here. So it was a very lonely, lonely life. And, and they lived in many of the what are now SROs in the neighborhood. They were single room occupancy hotels. They lived there. And, and then some of the entertainment would have taken place in the society buildings, which were the places for sort of mutual support. They, they weren't allowed anywhere else. I mean, if you think about it, my, my father was born in 1933 at that time. I don't think he was allowed in the Hudson's Bay. You couldn't go to a theater, you couldn't go to a swimming pool. So there was a lot of places that were off limits. But in Chinatown, this was kind of the, the refuge. And in these society buildings, that's where they, you know, they would play mahjong and, you know, they would, they would sing and, 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 and look after each other. Well, I think there was, you know, a lot of debate within the community whether or not should they go and fight or not fight. And you can see why, you know, there's a certain group would say, well, let's not fight because they don't even accept us as Canadians, even if we were born here. But then there was also a strong a voice that was saying, you know, but maybe if we do go and fight, then this will be our pathway to citizenship. And so, you know, it's really quite remarkable. I think it's another really important part of the Chinese Canadian story about how they were willing to fight for a country that actually hadn't accepted them. But when they came back victorious, that it took another two years and they won the right to vote it was a huge, huge contribution once again and laid the foundation for, in some ways, our multicultural, you know, fabric that we have in Canada. Well, this, this chapter, we called it the boom years. So you're absolutely right. This was a sort of like, sort of, I think, the high point in, in Chinatown where, you know, after the family reunification, you know, people were coming back. And this was a center point uh, for people because, you know, so much of uh, Chinese life revolves around food. And, and so this is a place where you could come shopping and you get the, 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 the Chinese, you know, the, the food products. But there's also restaurants. And I think that that was really sort of the beginning of the integration of Chinese into the mainstream because everybody was coming to Chinatown, not just the Chinese. You know, I think all of us who grew up in Vancouver have incredibly fond memories of the different restaurants that we used to go to. And, and I think that that was one of the reasons why I always believed that there could be a very strong revitalization movement because anybody who grew up in Vancouver remembered those happy days, whether or not you were Chinese or non-Chinese. It was a place for everybody. So this is the Yu Chu Chow studio that we, we created. And Yu Chu Chow was a, a well-known photographer that took thousands of photographs of, of not only Chinese families, but of the uh, you know, South Asian community, the black community, the Japanese community, you know, people who weren't able to get photographs in a studio that was run by whites. And if you think about it, it was an important way of them communicating with the folks back home. For instance, my grandfather, he, was, he came here in uh, 1900s. He died when he was 93, but only went home once during that period. So this would be their way, their kind of lifeline to, to tell the people back home, their loved ones that, you know, we're doing well and would be able to share stories of, you know, marriages, births and, and different significant events in, in one's life. For me, and there's many others who are also working on, on trying to rebuild Chinatown because for me, it is the physical legacy of that sacrifice um, that the earlier generations had made. This is where, after the railroad, after the workers had no place to go, this is actually where they came. 
and tried to build a life for themselves, a place where they felt safe and where they eventually ended up thriving. So I like uh, many of the parallels. You know, there's a lot of community building, and I think, you know, the world is in, an, in great need of, of some of these old lessons of how we help one another.